<laughs> Welcome back. We want to thank you again for joining us today for this Overcoming PTSD conference. We are so excited to get into this afternoon session with Dr. Henry Wright. So remember, put away all the distractions, mute your phone, and stay tuned for testimonies and special offers at this next break. Enjoy. See you soon. I'd like to talk about the conscious. The conscious, of course, is what you're aware of consciously. High conscience, we're in, the, we're in the conscious world. We're in the beta brainwave world. And beyond consciousness is what? You're always told subconscious. Then you were told it was unconscious. And then if you follow Jungian thinking, it's the collective unconscious. So we're there conscious, unconscious, subconscious, well, we're all a little bit slow wondering what day it is. Many of the research material that we have about PTSD indicates something is beyond conscious. They don't know what's beyond conscious. They don't consider fear to be beyond conscious. They consider, consider fear to be an emotion that produces anxiety coming out of stress. The Bible defines what's beyond conscious. So what is called the subconscious is actually the spirit of man. Now, the spirit of man is influenced by whatever is spirit. Your mind just doesn't need to be renewed. You need to take control of your spirit man. My soul should be the last to catch up. My spirit man should be ignited with truth that the Holy Spirit uses to define what is sanity and insanity. And actually, I want to tell you about insanity. That word really scares people. I don't know if you know this or not, but America is the number one insane nation in the world, statistically, according to the Journal of American Medicine. One third of the American population is on some type of psychiatric medication. We are now number 45 of all industrialized nations in terms of longevity, but we spend more money trying to stay alive in fear than any other nation in the world. These are times that you don't need to be a statistical casualty. Modern medicine, I have to be honest with you. Modern psychiatry, I have to be honest with you. Not that I'm dishonest. 42, mil 42 billion is spent on uh, treating psychiatric. 42 well, if we could bring that into the church, we'd, we'd, we'd rattle the cage of the devil. $42 billion spent in America trying to remain sane. Can I tell you something? Any thought that you have, emotion, thought, feeling, that differs from God's word is a form of insanity. You know that ignorance is a form of knowledge? You didn't know that, did you? Well, what do you think ignorant people think? You mean ignorant people just don't have minds? Come on now, track with me. Ignorant people have a mindset that's ignorant, do they not? So what separates you from them? How many of you are ever ignorant in your lifetime? How many of you ever knew it? No, you didn't. You thought you were so smart. The spirit of man is the compositeness of what is called subconscious. Even Carl Jung, 
or Jung, as they would call him, Jungian, Carl Jung, in his journey, authenticated the Bible, and it became unfashionable in his time to authenticate, authenticate the Bible. So he changed the nomenclature, what he originally called evil spirits that were influencing humans through temptation to cause them to have stinking thinking in his journey, because he, he was a son of a German Protestant pastor. And so he changed the nomenclature. Instead of being evil spirits that would speak to us out of the beyond conscious to influence us, he called them the archetypes and dark shadows of our ancestral darkness. Because what he saw, the things in people's minds that caused the problems in thinking had been in their family trees for a long time. Most of us are carriers of the insanity of our parents and grandparents. And we pass it on to our children and grandchildren. And nobody is stopping it. Because we're oblivious to what truth is. We're creatures of habit. We're habitually creatures. And we act through life like a stream wandering down a hill. Wherever it goes, it goes. Now, I'm not here to scare you about this. I want you to wake up. We didn't come here to give you facts that you would be smart. We came here to show you an insight that possibly could change your direction and your families forever. But it isn't up to God. It isn't up to us. It's up to you. I read somewhere, I think it was in the ancient writings, That you're to work out your own salvation daily. Say, well, I'm already saved. Then what happened to you? Did you digress? Did you regress? What happened to you? How come you get all that stuff in your U-Haul? You drag it out. You look at it. You show your friends. Go to therapists to help you understand the stuff in your U-Haul. Get prayer for things in U-Haul that you don't understand. A lot of people want God to heal them, but they don't want to remove things from their lives that cause the problem. If God healed you of all of your problems, but you didn't remove the thing that caused the problem, you'd, you wouldn't keep your healing. God's not the author of confusion. Carl Jung tracked an invisible kingdom. He saw what it was doing to people's minds. And he coined the, fra the, cra the, the phrase, the collective unconscious. And out of the collective unconscious come the archetypes and dark shadows of our ancestral darkness. He also channeled three principal deities in what's called channeling. He channeled Philemon, which is his principal spirit guide, and he channeled two other anima and animus. They were evil spirits that gave him, in fact, Carl Jung said this, and I quote him if I may. So in, you can go to your public library and find this stuff. He said, all that I know about psychiatry and, and psychotherapy, I learned from my spirit guides. Did they appear to him and say, hey, I am your spirit guide, Philemon. May we have a chat? No. He opened himself up to voices. And through something called automatic handwriting, or journaling, you Christians are going to get upset with me now. Automatic handwriting or journaling, what he wrote, a spirit using his faculties wrote the information as it came to him. He acknowledges that. Course of Miracles, maybe you've heard of it, written by a spirit guide. How much more stuff do we listen to from within? Listen, folks, I didn't write the ancient writings. I have my hands full trying to understand them like you do. But Jesus was very clear that this problem began within. Begins within. Did he say that? It's not what goes in here and goes in the belly and goes out of Charmin land that causes the problem. It's what's coming out of here. 
deep. Your spirit man's inside here. He's in here. That's the real you. That's the eternal you. And the Holy Spirit needs to be able to have access to you, but the Holy Spirit will not access you void of the word. Could I add something with the union uh, therapies? Um, when I was an atheist, I worked with schizophrenic um, youth at treatment centers, and I was supervising graduate psychology students from University of Berkeley, California. And I taught them under the direction of what we thought at that time that we would take these children into their dreams and listen to the dreams and draw out um, archaic material in, in the unconscious mind and then give them a story of who they were with uh, mythological names. And that was to be their journey for the rest of their life. And obviously, it was devoid of anything biblical. And um, those children did not get better. You can move the pieces around, but it doesn't mean you're going to make a picture out of the puzzle. And you can move the pieces around, and many times we're moving the pieces around, but we don't get the picture. Let's move ahead a little bit here as we move into this afternoon. Some of the PTSD therapies that are being offered. Uh, and I won't spend a lot of time because this is not designed to be a clinical conference. It's designed to be an informational conference to help you process information, to help you understand and take away, well, hopefully we're going to take away the big mystery of PTSD. I think we've done a little bit of that already today, have we? And, uh, and so the first main PTSD therapy now being offered uh, by the government and, and therapist is called MRT. By the way, it's called brain zapping. I, I did that just now, you know, to catch that little critter on my ear. Brain zapping... Uh, is interesting because it uses electricity and it's magnetic resonance therapy using pulsating energy from a magnetic coil being shot directly into your cortex. How about getting a charge? Uh, you know, some of the things that were done to you, Pastor Anita, when you were coming through this thing, and they killed how many of your brain cells? Electroshock treatments. In fact, electroshock therapy is now on the up, ring, up, up size, where in order to, to help you remove thoughts that are tormenting, they're going to destroy the brain cells. You need as many brain cells as you can keep. I know one of the times, and in, in you had, uh, it had even affected your IQ. In one of the ministry sessions with, with uh, Pastor Anita that we did years ago, because he had been subjected to so many uh, of, of, of this therapy, it had affected her ability to process information. I'm just going to talk because I'm, I'm also a believer, and believers are supposed to work with the Father by the Holy Spirit to do healing and deliverance and cures. Most believers should be doing that. Um, at one point um, before I met Dr. Wright, um, I could not speak or understand English, and they did thousands of dollars worth of testing and found out that I had moderate to severe brain damage from near organic brain damage. Um, possibly due to being hit in the head with, with a baseball bat and near drowning and the shock treatments and psychiatric drugs. In the, um, in the Gift of Miracles, we're going to minister late, late today perhaps to some 
damaged and enlarged amygdalas. Um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for the church. And in the ministry to Pastor Anita, as I as a believer, God could do something that science and doctors and psychiatry could not do. Calling those things that are not as if they are. Expecting the Father, by His Spirit, in Jesus' name, to fix body parts that were damaged or missing. When I spoke new brain cells back into you in Jesus' name, expecting the Father, by His Spirit, in Jesus' name, to replace every brain cell that man had destroyed. It happened. Her, her brain became magnificent with no evidence of damage. Her IQ jumped back to where it usually was. She's a very smart lady. Don't, don't, don't tell her that. But it, she became too smart. And, and uh, she's, she's a, a real asset to the kingdom. When man had written her off as hopeless, she's a, a, a wonderful symbol of the Father's great love and power. You too. God is no respecter of persons. I have documentation that when I was eight years old, my parents signed a paper that they could drill a hole in my head to try to stop the craziness. And I remember uh, Dr. Wright and, and Pastor Donna praying for me too, for those brain cells to be restored. And I'm just totally amazed at what I do that I couldn't do before. The, the, constant, the level of concentration that I have that I just never had. And, and I'm a very thankful person. Which is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven? Or pick up your bed and walk. What has happened to the Christian church that says all we have left is salvation and no help in between? You have not because you ask not. This uh, is a very dangerous um, procedure called um, brain zapping or MRT. The other one is called PE, or Prolonged Exposure Therapy. And uh, this is where they get the person with the therapist to begin to relive and express the trauma, like war or whatever, and record it on a tape recorder. Then play it back over and over and over again. So that person is forced to relive and that would desensitize them to the event. That is the, these are the two major therapies now being offered to our vets. Is, now in the Merck manual, the DSM-4 is in the Merck manual here, uh, one of the uh, therapies for phobias and panic attacks, especially phobias, uh, is continued exposure to the stressor. Now, there's a side to this that works. Because if you're running, you'll never defeat anything. At the same time, you just say it's mind over matter that you're going to face this, 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 and this, and somehow <clears throat> be able to diminish the power of it is, is very dangerous and really counterproductive. However, uh, Pastor Anita, in your journey of recovery, God did use me to help you take back some ground. Now, I didn't ask you to relive it, but I asked you to face it. And she was already to everything. And she could walk on the grass outside. If she didn't walk on concrete in the sidewalk, she'd go catatonic on the grass. Uh, she was severely damaged when she came to, to us at age 56, you said. Severely damaged. In the course of helping her take her life back, she was highly phobic to smoke, not cigarette smoke, but like a fireplace. I never forget the time we went to, took you to that barbecue restaurant in your journey of walkout. And we went to this, you know, barbecue restaurants, you know, they got the, 
the wood there and they got the barbecue, you know, and out of the chimneys, all this barbecue smoke. Well, we went and ate and she barely survived it because of the smell inside the restroom. But when we came out and got in the car to go back to the ministry, I decided it was time for her to face her fears. So we had this big Oldsmobile station wagon. We had a bunch of our team there, and you were in the back seat with a couple other ladies. And here's this restaurant, this chimney, and the, and, the, and the smoke is just billowing all over the parking lot. So I pulled the car right after the base of the chimney, rolled all the windows down, and I said, oh, man, God loves a good barbecue. Do you know it was the bar- you know that the Old Testament sacrifice was a barbecue? Come on now, work with me. The Old Testament sacrifice was a barbecue, wasn't it? So if God loves a barbecue and the smell of it came up as a sweet smelling aroma. Sister, welcome to God's land. 6 hours later, we were still in a session. And the spirits were so stirred up that there was a bucket there, and they were burping them. And they said, I can't believe we're casting ourselves out. The spirits were just moving. (laughs) Those were some good, good, good times of our learning curve. And uh, another another area was the near drowning incidents. We went to to the church, went to a... uh, Oh, I don't know, it was a local place where they go swimming in, you know, park and so on. And, and there was a, a shallow area, and there was a, a dock one out way out there. And, and, I, and I, said, um, I said, Anita, because she loves to swim, but, you know, trauma will take you from, phobias will take you. So I looked at her, and I said, you think you can walk out there? And when you get so far, it's going to be over your head. Can you swim to the dock? She looked at me like she'd seen a ghost. And she looked at me, and you know what she did? She picked up her faith, not her fear. And she started that walk out across that water. And when you got out there, you swam to the dock and climbed up on it yourself. And that day, she defeated that fear. Squashed it. Squashed that bug. So, you know... Yes. Oh, we've got another. We've got another version. It wasn't right, was it? All right. It was close, but it wasn't right. See how well I do. Okay. So. Hi. Hi. Who, what, who are you? I'm Pastor Hen- Henry Wright's wife. No, you're Pastor Donna Wright. But I'm your wife. But you're also. I am. Okay. You're. You're. I want to tell the story. Can we, can we just take a break from Mr. Niss over to the They are sitting too date. close together. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I probably shouldn't have done that. We want to go on a date. No, uh, hey, back to the story. Okay. okay. So we act, it was a big lake, and it had a big dock, and we had been camping. Well, I didn't make it big enough? No, it was big. Cause it was big. Wasn't it big? It was big. And there was a long dock, and I think you walked out on it first and kind of surveyed it. And we're all just sitting around chatting, you know, and, and eating snacks and stuff. And all of a sudden, we look around, and Anita's gone. And oh, yeah, the kids cool. had different floats, so there was this pink inner tube. Okay? And we're looking around. I'm glad you're remembering now. Yeah. Yes. And we're, I'm going, where is Anita? Because we're, you know, I'm kind of, we're all kind of keeping an eye on her because she's in walkout and, I mean, seriously traumatic stuff in her life. And we're just kind of looking around. And there goes Anita with this <laughs> pink inner tube around her waist, <laughs> little, little kid one. And she is determined, okay? She's got that look on her face. And, and, and we're all going, is it going to be okay? Is it going to be okay? So we're all watching her, okay? But she doesn't know we're watching her because we're trying to let her have her, her moment. So off she goes into the water, and it's like, you know, you know, like ankle, knee, thigh, and pretty soon she's way out there, and she's just bobbing around having a great time. And, and we were so excited about her victory. Is that how it happened? That's close. Yeah, I, I thought it was. <laughs> That's from our perspective. Yeah, I think at one point I did lose the inner tube. Um, you could have. When I was out there, because the history of it was my brother and a cousin, when I was five years old, took me out to the diving board area, and um, I couldn't swim. And for various family reasons, 
they wanted me dead. And nobody was watching, so they took the inner tube away from me, and I went to the bottom. And someone just diving in happened to feel a kid hanging onto their leg. I don't know if they knew it was me, but um, so my life was saved, so I had to reclaim it. You did. Uh, everybody has their degrees of trauma. We're talking about the collective, collective unconscious, and we're talking about another kingdom. And while we're here, I might just bring your testimony into a little clearer focus. It's in your book, and it's in the book A More Excellent Way. But when she was five, her brothers tried to kill her again. They put a bag over her head, turned around to disorientate her, and sent her, said, go this way, little sister. And it was the doorway to the steps to the cellar. She tumbled head over heels to the concrete below. When she hit the bottom, terrorized, she didn't get up alone. There was an evil spirit with her. His name was A.L. Ice. He was the first of several spirits that became part of the profile of multiple personality disorder. You have none of those today. I cast them out in Jesus' name. You say, what? Did he say that? Uh, yes, in fact, your psychiatrist in San Francisco a couple years after this happened had diagnosed you with MPD. You went back and saw that same psychiatrist, which pronounced, I have this in my files in writing three pages long from a psychiatrist in San Francisco of her remarkable freedom from MPD in writing. It was interesting because I didn't say, a, she was my therapist for 11 years trying to integrate and fuse these evil spirits. You know, she thought they were multiples. But um, when I walked into her office after my ministry, um, she just broke down and wept. And I hadn't said a word, but she could tell from having worked with me 11 years, I wasn't the same person walking in that room. Praise the Lord. It's fantastic. See, there's hope, isn't there? There's absolute hope. The other, the other part is uh, CPT, which is cognitive processing therapy, which can I boil this down? Let's talk about it forever. The next one that is common is uh, theta brainwave healing. Now, theta brainwave healing, if you go to your websites and look up theta brainwave healers, they're all over the place. They're, they, uh, it's what's called uh, conjuration or guided imagery where a person is, is called to relive the trauma event. And an invisible being, it can be a dead relative, it can be an angel, it can be Jesus, it can be whatever you think is out there with a therapist guiding you to that place is going to come and heal you. The Christianized version is known as theophostics. It is straight, not from heaven. Because what happens in theta brainwave healing, and I have my research done well, folks, in the study of the University of New York and rats and what's called cerebral amnesia. Because when you're forced to relive trauma, but you don't have a resolution, the no protein synthesis occurs to allow you to process what happened to you and come to a conclusion that it doesn't torment you. The next thing that happens when you study theta brainwave healing it produces something called cerebral amnesia. Folks, I didn't make this up. And what is cerebral amnesia? Blocking of memories. Now you have the trauma event. That memory is now blocked. You still have torment, but now you don't know why. So you go back to the therapist who did this guided imagery invoking this invisible being. And you say, I still have torment. Then you have additional problems because they're going to do something where they, by the power of suggestion, they give you false memories. Then you have another problem. I have to tell you, it's a very serious defect. And God doesn't want you to go into cerebral amnesia. You can't hold every thought captive if you're in cerebral amnesia. It is a serious defect. The Christian church is filled with it. I challenge you if you don't think I'm right, prove me wrong. 
And all you have to do is go to your websites, look up Theta Brainwave Healers. Not one is Christian, but the model is the same as the Christianized model. They're no different. And for those that say that, well, Jesus is the healer. He was there when you were victimized, when you were raped, when you were victimized. He was there all along. Now, because I'm here to help you, we're going to relive this trauma, and he's going to come and heal you. That's sadistic. Next problem, theologically. I might as well say this and get it out of here. The Father's the healer, not Jesus. You say, what? It was the Father that healed through Jesus by the Spirit of God. Read Acts 2 and 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a man approved amongst you by signs and wonders, which God did by him as you yourself also know. Who did the healing through Jesus? You go to Acts 4, the apostolic standard of ministry, of prayer, Peter and John, whoever they were there. You go and see what their prayer was. They prayed to the Father and said, Father, in the name of your holy child Jesus, come and do signs and wonders. In the name of what? Now, for those that practice inner healing, I've got a great teaching. I think it's available in our bookstore or in our resource. It's called Inner Healing, What It Is, What It Is Not. It is must listening, folks. You're going to be sucked into all kinds of therapies that are as dangerous as you can imagine. But if you, if you look into this a little deeper and you think about this, and I challenge people in conferences, if you are practicing inner healing of trauma events and trauma memories, you're calling Jesus into the picture to come and do the healing. And I just told you Jesus is not the healer. The Father is. Why don't you call the Father in and see what he does? Number two, if Jesus is the healer, as you say in your Christianized versions of Theta Brainwave Healing, if he is the healer, as you say, is he not the healer of the body, not just the soul? So why don't you go into your churches and call Jesus in in a church service or in a private therapy setting and ask him to heal your patient of all their physical diseases and see what you get? You're going to get nothing. Now, I know I've challenged this audience. You need to be challenged. And you need to be challenged with sound doctrine, first of all. Secondly, I haven't seen the evidence yet in 30 years of the church getting any saner because of these therapies. I haven't found the church getting any more well because of all the models of healing. In fact, I'm finding a very sick, discouraged, depressed, anxious church suffering for Jesus. It's my industry. I'm concerned. There's not a church out here that's not sick. Why should we be sick? The world should be sick. Why is it? Well, it could be because of some of this stuff right here. Maybe you're being trained to stay tormented. Maybe your therapy models are designed to keep you from being free. Uh, did you weren't given any antidepressant drugs or any psychedelic drugs, were you? Or? No. Um, we ate at, at a lot of restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did that because he said he put meat on your, he put, uh, you know, meat on your bones, so I want to make sure you had enough of that. I was given a steady diet of the Word of God. I would add goofy and... I would, and the Bible would be opened up to me and to read this. That's what I had to study. To know the truth, the truth shall, no, that's NIV. The truth hasn't set anybody free in Christianity. Truth applied makes you free. To know truth will not necessarily set you free, but what do you do with the truth? 
See, I like the King James. It's another truth that you shall make you, present progressive tense. Because you hear truth does not mean it's going to work unless you work with it. It's, you know, I know we're, we're preaching, so what? Let's go on to this. PSTD, PTSD, it's hard to say fast, is not just a vet problem. Would you agree with that now? So don't let the news make it that everybody else is immune to it. And you cannot say that PTSD is just the result of war trauma. What we are saying, certain people in war trauma events are susceptible to getting PTSD and others are not. We're going to move into that this afternoon. Why is it then that just a percentage of vets get PTSD? Or did the foundation of PTSD begin earlier in life? Could it have begun in childhood? Could it have begun in utero? Could it have begun in your family trees? The teachings on iniquity are not understood in Christianity. Not understood at all. Did we have that other book? Oh, yeah, here it is right here. I bought this book. It cost too much money to say nothing. It, it's, as you read this, you'll get dizzy. But there are some things in here that are, are important, I think, uh, in this discussion. And um, what it says here, there are individuals exposed to the same stress trauma event, such as war or other, that will get PTSD and others will not. Then over here under the chapter 19, this book is... Uh, uh, assessing Psychological Trauma and PSD uh, by John P. Wilson and Terrence M. Keen are the authors, so you'll give the credits here. Uh, in chapter 19, a section by John Brewery, it says this, some of the findings of case histories of PTSD, um, both cross-sectionally and prospectively, seem to indicate that childhood maltreatment is a significant risk factor for later psychological disorder. For later psychological disorder. Now, this whole book, by the way, is about PTSD. So we're not cross-pollinating other teachings on stress or anxiety. What it says here in some of the uh, reviews, among the known effects of child maltreatment, are those seen in other forms of trauma, such as chronic PTSD. We'll find disassociation. That would be denial. That would be blocking. That would be the freezing. That would be the pretending that nothing really did happen. Uh, then there's disassociation. You may also have feelings of helplessness, guilt, shame, and low self-esteem. Tracking with it, you're also going to have easily triggered negative relational uh, issues with others. You're going to have anxiety, depression, anger. One of the things that we're finding with the amygdala and the enlarging of the amygdala, won't get there right now, there is a direct link to it in autism. We've been tracking... Uh, you know, learning disabilities for a long time. We're not teaching that here. But we certainly understand uh, autism and Asperger's syndrome fairly well here in case histories. Uh, and it has nothing to do with vaccinations, contrary to one of our presidential candidates' recent statement. Really, um, vaccinations have nothing to do with uh, autism, folks. Just mark it down. That's just an opinion. Uh, sexual dysfunction. Um... Abuse survivors are most likely to engage in drug and alcohol abuse, as well as externalizing behaviors such as compulsive and indiscriminate sexual activity, binging, chronic overeating, antisocial behavior and aggression, suicidal ideation and behavior, and self-mutilation. These can all be found in some of the life manifestations of people that have had 
some type of victimization beginning in childhood. This article and this book kind of tracks us in the direction of where we're going, that there seems to be some evidence that this is also the foundation, not only for PTSD, as I mentioned to you earlier, but also, we're very clear, is the same foundation for such disorders of allergies, seemingly allergies, as MCSEI, multiple chemical sensitivity, or environmental illness, or multiple allergies, and we went into that earlier. So, we would like to stop a moment and talk about stress in infancy. And you girls can pick up on some of these notes that we have here. But this is the National Center for PTSD that I'm, that I'm quoting from now. You girls will go through these notes and see if there's anything significant that we need to talk about. Uh, but here's what it says. Although most people who go through trauma will not get PTSD, you are more likely to develop PTSD if you were directly exposed to the trauma as a victim or as a witness. Um, it goes on down through here's the life circumstances. Um, had an early life-threatening event or trauma, such as being abused as a child, have another mental health problem, have family members who also have had similar problems and mental health problems, a person who's had little support from family and friends, that would be beginning in childhood, has recently lost a loved one, especially if it was not expected, has had a recent stressful life change, um, uh, drinks too much alcohol, or you're a female. You're more susceptible if you're a female. Why? I started to talk about this this morning. You ladies are the weaker vessel, according to Scripture. That does not mean that you're inferior. I did not say that, did I? That means if you're the weaker vessel, God intended that someone stronger than you be over you, that you don't have to have it together. Come on, ladies, you can say amen to that. You're not supposed to be strong. You're not supposed to be in charge of everything. You're forced to sometimes. But God intended for you to be able to be that female and that nurture and, and, and the children and the family without the pressures. And you are to be nurtured. You're to be loved. You're, to be, you're the queen. You, and you've not, many of you have never been that. You go into the church, they diminish you even in the church. Only people that are male really are called of God in a lot of Christianity. Wait a minute. I read somewhere, I think it was the ancient writings. It says, it says in Christ, there is neither male nor female, bond nor free, Jew nor Greek, but all of us have been made equal partakers of the promises and the benefits. Welcome, ladies, to the kingdom and the family of your father. However... There is a government. Amen. And that government cannot be chauvinistic. That government cannot be controlling. That government cannot be filled with rage and anger and demands. And ladies, you're not called to be slaves. You're called to be equal partners in a relationship. If that has not happened, disease is at your door. Fear is at your door. Everywhere as you turn. Enough of that conversation. Women are not the only ones who fall into a category of high percentage talk about would create, get PTSD possibly. Also, um, African Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans tend to succumb to PTSD. But think about why that is. I mean, what happened to the African Americans? They were displaced from their home. What has happened to many, many Hispanics? They've been displaced. And also with Native Americans. So that sets you up. That predisposes that group to when something happens in their life, they're just not able to assimilate it or, or handle it. They go into fight, flight, or freeze. Before you go to that one, uh, Pastor Anita, I want to read this one. This is from <clears throat> Telehealth. 
History of family abuse linked to serious stress in children. Children exposed to potentially traumatic experiences including family violence and abuse are at risk for a serious stress disorder. Also, <clears throat> um, the impact of domestic violence and the forms of trauma coming out of the violence uh, is, is extreme in children. They found that also among almost 25% of children exposed to potentially traumatic events, including violence within and outside the family, had symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to tell you another maker for possibly PTSD is in the school system and in the educational system because those kids are cruel to each other. I've, I've tracked many diseases for many years. Scoliosis is basically a fear disorder of children who feel guilty because they don't feel like they measure up, involving an imbalance of proprioception to the thalamus gland, producing the curvature of the spine. And that comes because the child doesn't feel like they belong in the group. And they feel inferior, they feel like they had to perform, they feel adequate, and that produces a sensory pathway. And uh, we've had many people healed of scoliosis other than sticking rods in them and all the other garbage of the Middle Ages that's happening in ignorance right now to our children. Uh, scoliosis is a very fast increasing uh, childhood disorder because the families are becoming more dysfunctional, the schools are more dysfunctional, and it's a horror story everywhere as I turn and listen to what children are doing to each other. Forget about adults. The competition, the abuse, the verbal, the making fun is all stress. And so enough said of that. What do you have? Um, this article relates to how sad moms uh, change a child's brain. Uh, and I'm going to read some of this to keep, keep it together a little better. Um, new research shows that children with depressed mothers can have enlarged amygdala, the part of the brain responsible, again, for emotional responses and detecting threats. For too many new mothers, what should be a time of joy is instead one of darkness visible between 5 and 25% experience depression, and the rate may exceed 40 among low-income and teenage moms. A depressed mother tends to withdraw from her children, becoming disengaged and non-responsive, a less extreme form of the emotional and social deprivation that young children suffered in um, a notorious Romanian orphanage. In those orphans, twin brain structures called the amygdala tend to be larger than those in, of children reared by engaged loving parents. And now a new study finds that the brains of children who grow up with a mother who suffers from depression show the same changes. Uh, the good news about this, if that child is brought into a loving environment, uh, those changes that could lead to PSTD uh, can be reversed. And so it's important that ch children have access to people who can love them, even if it's not their mother. Can I read this? Yes. Uh, what you just said is really in the same article here. Um, and um, it, it says here that um, the information about the uh, brain, the amygdala, the brain can change in both structure and function in response to experiences for the worst that makes it be wrong, suggests that what can be enlarged by one environment, which would be as we're going to get into the enlargement of the amygdala, can be returned to normal by another. So this is where, this is where believing families and churches can be safe places for the recovery of everyone, that we can begin to teach how to live properly and godly, with godly values so that we can take these people that are prone to PTSD and phobias and panic attacks that have been brought up in these atmospheres where you have these problems, bring us into a loving atmosphere, and 
it seems to be from their information that that amygdala can, rather than being enlarged, can shrink back to normal size. If that happens, PTSD and phobias and panic attacks at this level are a thing of the past. That is healing, folks. Now, many people think that healing is simply God zapping you. And you're always looking for somebody to zap you with some kind of anointing. The church is filled with that. You travel all over the world finding a, finding a qualified zapper to knock you over, make sure you're well, and get you up healed. What you don't understand is that, the, the, and this is what we find here in Being Health, the greatest degree of healing that happens here and worldwide is because people change direction in their spirituality and their personality, and the bodies conform to health. So rather than looking for a pill or a moment or an anointing or a zap, why don't we just change into God's image? Why don't we just begin to rethink our personalities and our spirituality and begin to live differently with others? And instead of getting mad at somebody when they speak evil to you, understand that it's not them anyway. It's the thing within them manifesting. And so why don't you learn to be a gift? Be a gift to mankind. Why don't we begin to, let, to plan to be a safe place for others? You know, God might use you to produce incredible healing just because you change and other people want to be around you because you're safe. How many like safe people? How many don't like safe people? You like? You don't like safe people? You like safe people. Let me ask you a question again. How many don't like unsafe people? Don't like unsafe people. I didn't say unsaved. How many don't like unsafe people? Safe. How many? How many? The rest of you like unsafe people, right? Well, I only saw a few hands go up. Okay, I got to get this straight. How many do not like unsafe people? How many of you here like safe people? Then, if you're so smart, I got you, don't I? If you're so smart, then you're going to be a safe person or an unsafe person. You know, unsafe people don't like to hang around safe people. So let them have their pity parties. Let them have their damage parties. Let's have fun with people who want to be safe. Maybe the people that are unsafe will like what God is doing in our life and find out why we're happier, why we're healthier, and why we're wiser, and why we're having so much fun and so much joy, and they'll get tired of being unsafe themselves. You might start a virus from God running that's contagious. People need to see God in your lives. Not just now, but we need to teach our children and grandchildren how to raise safe families. I've spent a few, a little of my time coming on my own journey of not being a safe person growing up on my knees before my children repenting for being unsafe. The healing that came out of that has been lasting today. The healing and the recovery and the ability of those children and my relationship with those are wonderful because I took responsibility for being an unsafe father. I didn't know better. It was classical to be unsafe. Besides, I'm macho. What you got? If you've been to the For My Life program, then you, you've heard in the teaching disease profiles that to every thought that you have, there's a chemical reaction or a neurotransmitter or a hormone released. And we as parents, we have so much power to, to provide an environment for our children or our spouses, or our work, or the people that we work with, to release those good things, those good chemicals, those good neurotransmitters, those good hormones, to heal a person. The reason the amygdala is so large is because of the, the, the constant barrage of the stress hormone in utero. And the same things happen, it happens when the child is growing up. Not only that, anybody here have a preteen or a little teeny bopper? 
the same thing is happening then, not just when they're infants, but at that stage in their life. If something happens that's traumatic or something, and they don't have someone there to, to love them through it, to help them through it, and not always constantly, yay, criticizing them or telling them that they should be something that they're not capable of being right that moment, then that stress hormone is causing that amygdala to lar enlarge. So let's, let's do something different. Let's shrink that amygdala. Did we show chart E1? I went down through some of the conversation, but I don't think I showed the chart E1, and I think it was important. Uh, right here. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's hard to get these charts quickly off a resource and then it be able to be seen by you all here, so I'll, I'll help you understand. This chart is important. If you have both parents that have PTSD, right here, you see right here? Both parents, the chance for the children to have it is the highest level of exposure. 65% of children from stressed out PTSD parents will develop the same thing. I'll tell you why. Because fear is contagious. I said fear is contagious, if you don't understand it. Over here, this one here is maternal mother. You don't find the father. The father is paternal, is way down here. The dysfunctional mother is the number one cause for PTSD across the board. Dysfunctional mother. Where? Nurturing. One of the statistics that I haven't quoted in a long time is that science has showed from case studies that if a child is taken from the mother's womb, and I say natural birth is preferred, and given to the mother who immediately begins to talk to it, breastfeed, mark breastfeed down because this is part of the statistic, begins to breastfeed it, begins to nurture it, that asthma is prevented in that child for the first six years of its life. Statistical. We know asthma is fear of abandonment. So what happens is because the enemy, the villain, knows that if he can get you ladies not loved properly, you're going to have difficulty nurturing anybody. You're going to have difficulty really being that mud that you want to be because nobody's taking time for you. You're going to have difficulty being that wife because who's taking care of you? You girls aren't that strong. You want to be. And some of you rise up in matriarchal control and rulership because it's a matter of survival. But the whole family suffers. An enemy is laughing his head off. And the diseases that are coming out of ungodly order in the home are a plague. All learning disabilities. ADD, DHD. Dyslexia, autism, gender confusion are all found in the profiles of ungodly order in the home. The enemy wants to remove you men as godly covering. The worst thing the devil, I want to tell you what the devil fears, that you men will become loving patriarchs. Because if you decide to become loving patriarchs, the devil's PTSD will be start to be defeated because the mothers will feel more like nurturing their children. They'll feel more like being part of the family. It's a lonely life, ladies, when you have to be the head and the tail and everything in between. God didn't create you to be that strong. No wonder we have all these problems. Another issue um, concerning the men, uh, the fathers in the fam family that... I think it was something like 35% effect um, for PSDT um, is that if the child sees the father not treating the mother properly, that causes stress. Um, and that's a very serious issue that um, we deal a lot with in the marriage seminars 
about what the man is doing in the home. Moving into the amygdala, it's spelled how? A-M-Y-G-D-A-L-A. -A -A. Amygdala. Can you say amygdala? It's the best I can do, too. I want to read something from Science Tech in this research. The brain's emotional region grows bigger and more connected in children with daily anxiety. Researchers from Stanford University School of Medicine can predict, listen carefully now, can predict the degree of anxiety a child is experiencing by measuring the size of the amygdala in the brain region which is associated with emotion and decision-making. In fact, they discovered that a child experiencing greater anxiety than normal had a larger amygdala with stronger connections to other parts of the emotional brain. Now, because the child, could, they could see this, they were unable to predict if the child would get anxiety disorders as an adult at that level. But in tracking case histories through this process, it became evident that adults were carriers of the anxiety that, they, that began in childhood in an unsafe environment, trauma, unsafe performance. We gave you the reasons, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and drivenness and performance in order to receive the love and acceptance of a parent. Many of the uh, stress disorders that I've had to deal with are peculiar to different nationalities. It's amazing to see the flow of iniquity in different, different nationalities that, that surface, whether it's the black community with sickle cell anemia, or it's the Jewish community with chronic fatigue syndrome, for example. Every, every society and every group of, of uh, genetic groupings of people are carriers of what's been in that genealogy for centuries. You know, I just want to give you a scripture. A lot of people say, so when I got born again, I was free of everything from the past. No, you, get, you now have the power to defeat the things of the past. The issue is this, is that even when King David was repenting to the Lord in Psalm 51, he acknowledged that what took him to that sin was in him when he was conceived. In fact, he said this, In sin my mother did conceive me. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Some of the newer Bible translations have messed with canon so bad, so much, that even the word sin and iniquity has been tampered with. And what is called iniquity has just been changed into sin. That's unfortunate because it has caused the enemy who is tracking us generationally now to be totally hidden. Yet in... Um, in, in the ancient writings of, uh, of uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, it says that the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited. What's visited? This gets right into epigenetics pretty soon here, girls. The, the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. But to them that love me, this is verse 6, and keep my commandments, blessings to thousands. The, the key is this. Are we doers of the word? Are we really doers of the word? Everybody's into the prophetic these days. I heard some people know more about our future than God does. People come to me all the time because somehow they think I'm closer to God and I'm not really, I'm just a guy. 
but they always want a word from me. They say, Pastor, do you have a word for me? Oh, I said, thanks for asking. I certainly do. What is it? Read your Bible. <laughs> Why would God give me you a word when you haven't even read the original truth from Genesis to Revelation? When you finish Genesis to Revelation and have mastered it, come to me to see if I hear anything for you. It'll be a few years before you come back to me. So I have more things to do now. You see, it's just silly, isn't it? We're, we're so self-centered. Anyway, that's not my subject. Um, I wanted to add something about the size of the amygdala. Yeah. In uh, children, um, I haven't put it all together, but I think one thing that causes that amygdala to be larger in children under a lot of stress is because they're not being taken care of properly, uh, they tend to get hypervigilant, and even very young children, and scanning. Um, you know, let's say the, the mother is a drug addict, and the child isn't getting their food on time. This child is scanning, becoming anxious, and so forth, um, trying to, to really take care of itself when it can't. And I, I sort of experienced some of that because with my mother leaving the home the day I was born, and there were six other children, and um, my father was scattered and smothered, and they didn't know what was going to happen because she was out of the home for seven years, that there wasn't time for me as an infant. So they call them nannies now, but a housekeeper was taking care of me along with six other children, and she didn't have mothering skills. So I was left in my crib a lot. My sister said they all wondered why I didn't cry um, as a child. Um, I learned early there's no use in crying. Nobody's listening. And um, that's where a loving community comes in, you know, to restore some of that that was lost. You know, part of the, part of the things that uh, have worked so effective in being health is the, our ability and our compassion for people that come across our path. And I promise you that this Hope of the Generations Church and this team, uh, we love people. We don't understand the depth of it all the time. But it's not a job to us. It's not really work. It's part of being together. It's part of serving. It's part of being part of something. And, uh, and, but many people come because they're afraid to confess. Like you didn't have anybody to confess to. You had no one to, to succor you and to hold you through your fears and the confusion. Many adults... The, the effects of PTSD continue because even as adults, the, our families aren't necessarily safe places to confess. Because most families also are the publishers of the National Enquirer in their own style, especially with Facebook, you know. And so we, 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 we protect ourselves now. And then we have, then we have the great problem of betrayal. When you trust someone who betrays you in a confidence, it's one of the deepest wounds of the human spirit. In fact, the Bible says it goes into the deep, deep recesses of the belly. The tail bearer is a piercing arrow that goes deep, 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 deep. One of the things that we're teaching people to do is to be pierced but not wounded. Can't stop you from being pierced by irresponsible people around you, but you don't have to go to wounding. The only time you'll go to wounding is if you keep the record of wrongs of the wounding. And if you keep a record of wrongs of the wounding, you have a broken heart because you have bitterness. Because love doesn't even pay attention when wrong is done to it. But if you do, we've got a problem, don't we? I know it's easy to say this, but one of the things that we try to generate in our families and also in this, our own church body and in the ways of thinking of being healthy, because people come here from all over the world to the For My Life program. 
and they feel safe. Most of them feel safe. And they want to confess their fears. They want to have some place to hear. Somebody understands. Not somebody saying, get over it. You know. The scripture says this in James. Confess your faults one to another so that you may be healed. Are we safe places for people to confess to? Or do we have to go tell somebody the confession? That's irresponsibility. That's victimization. If somebody comes and confesses something to me as a brother, it stays right with me, folks. You're not my audience. I don't need to tell you a thing. Have we been responsible kings and priests in the making here? I think one of the missing links of Christianity is a place of honest confession. You know, talking about the amygdala, amygdala. I'm going to say I pronounce it wrong myself. I put a Leah at the end of it, you know. Uh, see, you know why? Well, my family tree always pronounces words funny. Like I say, wash. You know, wash the car. Although anxiety is a common emotional reaction to stress, it can lead to disabling conditions such as phobia, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and generalized anxiety disorder, which is sustained for too long. And because you're exposed to a trauma event doesn't mean you're going to get PTSD. We taught about long-term memory, did we not, today? Long-term memory occurs when you begin to rehash it, rehash it, rehash. And something can come along and help you rehash it. We, we taught that invisible kingdom, did we not? That'll help you remember. will trigger the recall, bubbling up, bubbling up, bubbling up. Until that's no longer random thought anymore, it's part, and actually, it can become part of your personality. Well, you don't have to think about it. It's just who you are. You're just a phobic person. No, you're not. You're a person that has been trained to be phobic. You can get untrained. You see what I'm saying? Now, what it says here is this. That prolonged stress... will create an enlarged and highly connected amygdala. Did I pronounce it right that time? I'm working on it so hard. How would you pronounce it? You did well. You go to the head of the class. Now, I want to take us up to chart F1. Look at all that matter up there. This amygdala, amygdala it's pretty small, isn't it? It's about the size of an almond. That little, that little gland right there, the enemy loves to use to get you scattered and smothered. To try to get you into fixation of fear. That here, you won't even... The real brain isn't able, able to function. You're a, actually, you're a victim of your own emotions. You know, what really is temptation and uh, the agreement with temptation is now just called a psychological defect or a negative emotion. If I hear the word negative emotion and psychological defect one more time, I'm going to lose it because it hides the real enemy. When you say that you just have a negative emotion or psychological defect, you are the problem. And even in Christian therapy groups, they will not show you the true enemy. They will not show you your enemy that's giving you those thoughts because they'll try to teach you that when you get born again, you, know, you are now immune to the enemy, which means that you're no longer able to be tempted but Jesus was tempted in all points such as we are, yet he didn't participate with the temptation. Neither do you. Neither do you. But if you're taught that you're the problem, you're going to be afraid of yourself. 
You know how many people I meet that are afraid of themselves? They have self-hatred, self-accusation, self-guilt, self-shame, self, 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 I'm the problem. Now, you're not the problem. You're a carrier of the problem. If you can dump what you're carrying, you get to stay and the problem gets to go. You decide what stays in your spirituality and your personality. I flush a lot of things every day that come to me. I'm an expert at flushing thought. It's easier than thinking about it for several hours. Say, but I had a thought. Isn't it real? No, it's temptation. Yeah, but it felt so real. Okay. Here's what the Christian church is practicing, this scripture. For as many as are led by their feelings are the sons of God. Is that what it says? For as many as are led by their emotions and feelings, they are the sons of God. What's it say? For as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. You have to make up your mind, are you a son and daughter of God or not? I didn't say you weren't. Well, if you're a son and daughter of God, it's time to act like it. Act like it. Say, you need to calm down, Henry. All right. What do we got up here? Here's your amygdala. How'd I do? It has the memory of fear. Here's your memory of safety. Here's your memory of fear. Here's fear. All this is just circling around and around. I want to tell you something. There's not one of you that's immune to the feelings of fear. There's enough around you to make you afraid, just not even thinking about it. If I thought about what could go wrong, everything is going to go wrong. If I thought about things that would speak to me that are negative, I wouldn't have time to be here today. I'd be micromanaging to pre prevent the negative from happening. So I'd be just like Job. What I feared greatly would come upon me. So if I don't want what I fear greatly to come upon me, then I'm not going to meditate on the things that I don't want to come upon me. Oh, it speaks to all of you. See, what Job feared greatly did what? Came upon him. Do you know that what you fear is headed your way? How many of you have thought you might hit your thumb with a hammer and did? Just because you thought you might, you did. It has happened. It happened to me a couple, three times. I set in, in, in motion an imbalance of proprioception that made that happen. Because I took my focus off the, the nail head and was concerned about my thumb. And my, my hammer said, no, it's not the nail head. It's the thumb. I'm going to hit it. That's exactly what happened. And how many times do we miss fire in life like that? How many times do we say, well, I better not talk to Sister Sally. She's going to put me down. You go to see Sister Sally. She puts you down. What you don't realize is that there's a kingdom working on both of you to make victims of both of you. Wake up. Or believe all. You got anything important? Because I, I, yeah, I got to get this microphone away from me here. What causes the amygdala to be enlarged? Well, lots of things. Primary in our conversation is prolonged stress. In this, uh, we're on uh, chart number F, if you have it in front of you, girls. There's some notes there if you want to talk about it. Since um, we want to make sure this was covered, but I think we did cover a lot of it um, about the amygdala being enlarged um, is, again, the prolonged stress uh, in adults and also in children, lack of nurture and trauma, hyperstimuli in environment and or changes in the environment, hypervigilance, um, there's some aspects um, in autism that there may be a tendency for that child who's 
drawn in on himself to protect himself um, from outer realities such as um, they d don't usually play alongside other children. They're more withdrawn and they have certain body movements and flicking of the fingers and so forth in order to manage the anxiety that's going on. And at the same time, um, they're studying that that might be a possibility of the amygdala being enlarged. Um, even in acute seizure activity, in more of a physiological stand, um, there may be an enlarged um, amygdala. Um, tumors uh, can cause that because of physiological one, changes. One of, one of the things that I remember in our study is that if the amygdala is damaged, like in an injury, a head injury or something, uh, the person has no fear. They could look down the barrel of a gun and laugh at the person holding it. They have no fear. One of the things, too, we maybe alluded to and didn't spend a lot of time in this discussion is in the, in the birthing of a child. We always talk about childhood abuse and so on. We've talked about some of the personality characteristics of uh, abuse in the family tree. But sometimes we look at a child as either has a natural birth or has a traumatic natural birth, or has a C-section. Each brings its own problems or successes. Ideally, a natural birth is preferable. Uh, I never forget the time that uh, Pastor Donna was having one of our children, and, and uh, you know, I've always been part of the birthing and so on, and, and we were at the hospital about 3.30 in the morning, and she was in labor, and, and I was dressing up in the scrubbies, you know, with the little booties and the mask and all that stuff. And I bent over to tie the strings on my booty, my footy things. And when I stood up, my daughter was out. I missed the whole thing. <laughs> and I told my wife, well, that was easy. Ready to try for another one? I think she's about to box my ears. <laughs> and, but... But natural births are preferable by God. There are things that restrict natural birth. Fear. Uh, we have, uh, uh, in, in Hope Generations Church here, we have life coaches. We have doulas that many times will go with our ladies right into the birthing room to coach and to be there. Uh, the husband needs to be part of the birthing. We coach the husband how to be part of the birthing so that it can be the beginning of a journey of a family not just a birth occasion, that that support will be there. Um, in, in, in this particular case, the natural birth should be without fear. But the medical center here in this town, this church was known to have ladies that dropped babies quickly and easily. And it became a matter of conversation just several years ago uh, uh, Adrian and Pastor Donna were asked to come to the nursing training center here in this county to, in, to give a lecture on why we're the only people group dropping babies like that. And it had to do with removal of fear. The worst thing you can do, if, if you, if you want to have a difficult birth, hang out with somebody who had one. And you will have a difficult birth because that fear is transferable as a temptation. So we, we really are quite, quite careful in, in that area. A child that is born naturally without complications will be a child that usually will play by the rules as a child, as an adult. They'll have a respect for authority. Because the cortisol imprint, we haven't talked about cortisol imprint a lot just yet, but we're going to get there a little bit later. The cortisol imprint in the limbic system gives that child biologically a, a right kind of fear. Now, there's good fears and bad fears. I drive on the right side of the road because I don't want to have an accident. Is that a godly fear? That was wisdom. 
when when the light changes, the red light goes from green to red, I try and stop. And that's a godly fear, isn't it? So there, there are things that we do that the God has created us with, you know, a fight or flight and all these things that are normal. So in the natural sense, correct, we want children that respect authority. I don't mean wrong authority. I'm, I'm talking about respect for elders and leaders, and we're losing that fast. A child that has a traumatic, a traumatic birth. Oh, I'm past my time. I'll finish quick. A child that has a traumatic birth will have too much cortisol released. And that child is prone to anxiety disorders because of the cord around the neck, uh, a breach. Uh, there's different things that can happen. A child that has been produced by a C-section has no cortisol imprint at all. Now, I, I don't want to say something that will come back and get me later because of the rebuttal. I'm just giving you facts, okay? I'm, I'm not saying anything. But a, a C-section child usually will never respect authority. Will be a problem in society and the church and the family because they don't have the cortisol imprint at all that helps them have that what we call biological godly fear. Now, if you've had children under C-section, don't run off with this and start causing chaos. Just listen. There's ways, there's ways, maybe we have such a rebellious society because our doctors are creating children that don't respect authority, apart from God's plan. Now, I know there's a place for C-sections. I know there's complications in, 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 the, in utero. I know that we don't have perfect, sinless people having babies, including Christians. I know the iniquity is there. I know there are things that are coming to family tree that are genetically impure. But if we could have our druthers, could I just give a standard for druthers, at the same time make a provision for C-section rather than lose the child? And then maybe we can disciple the child and get ministry to get that thing. I believe that we can lay hands on a child and God will put the cortisol imprint in there in Jesus' name. That's my opinion. And it's not that it wasn't a battle, it was a, uh, she had a lot of overcoming to do, but she had the tools that we didn't have before, and the knowledge, and the wisdom, and we had hope again, yes. and uh, God really uh, met us here, and delivered us, for, uh, I think it was Psalm 34.4 was one of our, our verses that we wrote on the mirror in the bathroom that uh, we sought the Lord, and He delivered us from all of our fears. All right, I'm Derek Brashear, and this is my wife, Melissa, and we're from Central Illinois. So we heard about being held through a counselor that we had used years prior, and she knew something about it. And um, so we, that's how we initially found out about it. I went to her with uh, two verses. One was 3 John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may uh, prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And then the other one was Ephesians 6.12, where it talks about, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the powers of the darkness of this age, and on it went. So with those two, she pulled out the white book and started to minister to me. And uh, that got me to the point where we decided, hmm, there's something to this being hell. And we decided to investigate it further on our own. And uh, that led us to Thomaston, Georgia. Well, if I had to describe our life before being health, I would say it was chaotic and disorderly. And we were living in fear. We were starting to lose hope for her health. Um, we were um, overwhelmed with our business because she needed a lot of care at the time. And um, I'll let you take it from there. I was pretty well isolated to my room. Um, we had gone to about five specialists trying to figure out what it was that I had. Um, and it, it boiled down to multiple chemical sensitivities and environmental illness. And uh, in the midst of our storm, um, 
Uh, Derek ended up three times a day cooking for me, bringing the meals to my room. And if I was to leave my room, this is what I needed to do. I would put on these goggles and then put on this mask And that was to help tolerate what was in the air, what was in the environment, um, because I had become allergic to about everything in the air that you can think of. Chemicals, uh, bacteria, molds. In fear of, of being sick, not sleeping, and all the other symptoms that, that come with multiple chemical sensitivities, uh, this, this was always by my side. It had become part of me. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. <laughs> Running a business, taking care of our son. We homeschooled, so I did most of that. I did the cooking, the cleaning, and uh, so when we heard about being health, it was uh, it, we had tried all the doctors, and so we were starting to get some hope. I'm like, well, well let's at least try God. Right. <laughs> We've tried everything else, and we're Christians, and we're going to church, but uh, there was something uh, that was pulling us here. Um, what I got here uh, was really connecting the dots for me. And one of the things that I remember uh, learning was that if you are going to go through this, it's a fight. It's a battle. And so I was prepared for that. I was so tired of living in this um, prison that, that I had kind of formed, then, and the enemy helped me to form that, that I was ready to break through. And whatever that took, we were gonna do that together. We were gonna overcome this. And with Derek's support, um, we did. And I remember on the second day, uh, out of fear, and, and wanting to control the environment, I uh, learned better. I repented to Derek for ungodly order. <laughs> and by this point, he's really liking the program. <laughs> I'm not even there, so. <laughs> he's at home watching our son. And um, But by, I, by day I Friday, uh, I really didn't know what was going on. I thought, well, I hope she's okay and things are going along and she calls and says on Friday, may I stay another week and go through the, the WOW program? And, and I said, well, if this is helping, by all means, please stay another week. And uh, we were glad she did. Yes. Oh. oh my. <laughs> Freedom! Much better. <laughs> I, I, boy, you wish you had known about it about 20 years yes. ago but um just the freedom to just leave her for her just to leave the house and to actually participate in our family and not be isolated to a bedroom on the bed all the time and, you know sleeping and so uh we came out of a um a, a, just this bondage and yes right. she, she walked out very quickly uh out the gate and so she was driving places and going places she hadn't been in a year and within a week. And um, by five months later, our son could eat anything he wanted to eat and he was reduced to five foods. And Melissa um, could go anywhere she wanted to go. And it's not that it wasn't a battle, it was a, uh, she had a lot of overcoming to do, but she had the tools yeah. that we didn't have before and the knowledge and the wisdom. And we had hope again. And God really uh, met us here and delivered us. For, uh, I think it was Psalm 34.4 was one of our, our verses that mm -hmm. we wrote on the mirror in the bathroom that uh, we sought the Lord and He delivered us from all of our fears. I would say if you have any desire at all to come to Thomaston, Georgia, to follow it, there are amazing people here. Uh, that'll provide a safe place to connect with God in a way that maybe you have never connected before. I know it happened for us that um, not only did we find freedom and victory, we also found a love that 
keeps pulling us back to Thomaston, Georgia. <laughs> and um, God has something special for all of us. And this really is a place to discover what that is. Yeah. I think when, uh, when you're in the muck, um, when, when your wife is sick and your business is, is stressful and you're taking care of everything, it, you'll try anything. And uh, so I, I, I just felt like my wife had a chance. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad she went and I, I don't know, I don't, what would I say to someone who was uh, a spouse? Just encourage them to come. And no matter what it takes to get them here, uh, I just sent her. I'm like, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did some pounding on doors and praying for I me did. before, I did. which gave him the peace to say go. I had to uh, pray about my wife coming here to be in help, and everything was just lining up for her to come here. It wasn't that it was easy, and there were the enemy didn't want us here, um, but we just felt like this was the place where we were going to. I was going to finally hear the answer. I, I would like to encourage someone that um, has a sickness or an illness that God is no respecter of persons. He loves you and He wants you to have freedom too. That's why He sent His Son so that he, we could be free and that we could overcome. And what He has done for us and our family, our son was only able to eat five foods. And now that he can eat whatever he wants to eat, he's not bound in fear anymore. He's willing to take on adventures and try a roller coaster and go swimming and um, things that troubled him before. And that we have freedom in going to churches and being a family and traveling and not worrying. We were talking the other day that it almost seems like we were never sick. We're getting to that point where it's hard to remember what that was like because we have found freedom and we've just stuck with it. Yeah. And the enemies come against us and we just stick with what being health has taught us and we're able to overcome. And I got my wife back. <laughs> she got her life back. And we got our family back. Yeah. And it's, God it's really, really restored, fun. God really restored us and gave us the tools to overcome whatever comes against us. I'd like to say God loves you. Yeah. He loves you more than, than we can even comprehend. And have the faith that if you take that step, He's going to meet you. And He knows what you need before you even start praying. So pray to Him and leave the consequences of your decision to come to Thomaston in His hands. Amen. And he'll take care of it like yes, he, he took care of it for us. Awesome. Awesome. Yes, um, it has been awesome. <laughs> God is good. <laughs>
your life and looking at your thoughts and looking at what is in your background, what's in your family history and looking at why you've got problems in your life or why you've had illnesses. So it actually is a way of thinking about disease from a, a biblical or a spiritual perspective and that allows you then to think is your life actually in line with the Bible or is it actually totally out of line with what the Bible teaches? It's a wonderful place. It's a wonderful cabin experience, you know, <laughs> and you get to hang out with really cool people. It's really neat to meet people from all over the U.S. and even from other countries here. The staff, the staff is at amazing. Hell is really, the oh my staff goodness, is amazing. you know, it started from on the phone, you know, mm -hmm. very engaging people, mm -hmm. and then to come and meet them in person and the way you know they take their time. They talk do. with you, you know, and um, give you their shoulder if you need to cry questions. on their shoulder. Yes. These people are so caring. There's no judgment. I have experienced love, compassion, acceptance of Christ through each and every one. All my life is life changing. Life changing. It's life changing. It's a change that other people can see. Take time out for your life. Don't miss the opportunity. Uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Back to back for my life. Mm. <laughs> this next part of our discussion, as we head towards the uh, time of application, which people would call that the ministry time, uh, we're going to call it applied principles, okay? To know truth and do nothing about it is kind of like vanity, isn't it? And all of us, I think, uh, have to some degree been exposed to rejection or emotional abuse, all the things that we mentioned. The, the thing when I, when I began to pursue this subject of PTSD, and I was asked to teach it, I said, how in the world can I take a full day and talk about four letters? And uh, at the same time, I had a quickening, and I began to talk to the Father about what I should do. And I didn't want to be so clinical and filled with so much jargon that we need an encyclopedia to understand it. You know, even being able to pronounce and spell the word amygdala is an exercise of futility for most of us. And... Um, so I was, I was asking the Father what I should do in, in this conference, because I know it's a big subject. The first thing that I sensed in my prayer time, that PTSD was not just a vet issue. It was a human issue across the board at some level. But I wanted to be able to prove it. I wanted to be able to prove it rather than just sense it. And I think our journey, we sh we've got so much research here, we'd be here for days of reading it to you. So we just kind of give you a little taste of some of the stuff here to keep you focused. I told the team, I said, they're, they're, they'll never remember the facts. But if we can paint a picture, you'll never forget that, will you? And so we can leave with you an impression. And there's a statistic that I heard uh, last year about uh, people that, are, uh, you know, go to conferences and hear sermons and things like that is that you've had to have heard something or seen it in its entirety six times just to retain 25% of what you heard or saw the first time. So some of you take notes, some of you do this, some of you do that. But if we could leave an impression. So what I, what I really was sensing can I prove that it's not just a vet issue? Then I begin to find in research that not all vets get it. 
but all are subjected to the same trauma events. That brought me down. Why? You know, I was talking to one of my team members in my yearbook from high school a few years ago. I'm quoted as, as saying something that I don't remember saying, but it's in my yearbook. And I guess I said it all the time. And here's what is quoted. One never knows until one investigates, does one. One never knows until one investigates, does one. I began, I'm a very curious individual, not in the wrong sense, but I always want to know why. I'd have been the kids that why, 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 why. And then when people didn't have answers, I had to go find out the answer. And I found all kinds of catechisms in Christianity when I got born again that didn't seem right to me, like God hates you and God wants you sick and he's trying to kill you and he wants you in poverty and, and, and you get a perfect healing in heaven, so suffer now, baby. You know, and I, and I just, it didn't ring true in my heart. So I had to go figure, was it right or wrong? So I had to become Berean. I had to go back and, and see what is true, what is not. So I sensed that if not all vets get PTSD, why? I began to find out why they were predisposed to it. They were predisposed on three levels. Childhood, because they were traumatized as children in the areas that we discussed already. It was in utero that they even, it transferred out of the family tree through genetics. Now, there's two parts to genetics I want to talk about. There's three parts. There is genetics in which the, the gene, do we, have, do we have that chart about genes up there? Um, let me see here if I can find the gene flow. Yeah, do G1 and see if it's the one I want. Is it G2? The, this is our code for, what is this here? Uh, that's, oh, that's epigenetics. We don't want to go there yet. Here is uh, the DNA of the, what's called the helix coil. And you all have this stuff in you. You didn't recognize it, but you're, it's in you there somewhere. And it goes in all your chromosomes. And you have a number of chromosomes that are, carry the genetic code of your ancestry and who you are as a member of the human race. The original, now these are amino acids. There are four of them. And these amino acids pair up like you see over here. See them? They pair up. They separate. See the pairing of four? I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's four different colors here. This, in this state, would be the way God created it from a genetic standpoint. If there is a genetic mutation, that means the amino acid um, connection here is changed, rather than being this, it's changed, see the different colors? You have yellow, orange, then you got orange, and where's the purple, and where, here's the green, but there's a purple one here. And that would produce the mutant copy. And then that cell would replicate itself in the human with a biological defect. And some of you could get things like color blindness, you could get, you know, albinoism, you could get whatever you are as a human, you are formed through genetics. Now, that's elementary, Sherlock. You all know that. You're so smart. Now, in this case, we have a gene which has mutated. The next part we're going to talk about a little later is something that comes along that doesn't cause the gene to mutate, but causes it to be redirected in its function. The next thing I want to throw at you is this, is something called familial. That word familial means peculiar to families or to the human race or ancestral. Ancestral, families, classes of people, etc. There's also something known as familiar spirits. Now, familiar spirits are familiar 
to your family tree. They have tempted and controlled your families from Adam. All of you have a common ancestry. All of us here are all descendants of Noah. That hasn't been long ago. You think, how long ago has Noah been? And 3,500 years. We've only been here 5,778 years from Adam. Did you know that? Check the Jewish calendar. We've been here less than 6,000 years from Adam. That's not long, is it? So all of us, I don't know why we hate each other for, we have a common ancestry. Noah was our father. I'm seed of Japheth. My ancestry is seed of Japheth. Maybe yours is seed of Ham. Maybe yours is seed of Shem. So what? Noah was our father. Everyone on this planet has a common ancestry. Now, there are, when, when, when David said this, when this thing with Bathsheba, he said in his time of repentance in Psalm 51, in sin my mother did conceive me, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. That shapen in iniquity, we took you to Exodus 20, verse 5, the iniquities of the fathers shall be visited, visited to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Now, in the ministry time today, we're going to skip over to Nehemiah 9, verses 1 through 3, when the children of that captivity saw why their parents and grandparents went into captivity into Babylon for 70 years is because they served sin, and they wanted the pagan nations and their ways of thinking. And they saw that it was God's judgment for not being a doer of the Word. All blessings are the result of being a doer of the Word. The reduction of all blessings by the villain is when you decide not to do the Word. Everything's, everybody, I started to talk about this today, and I, and I just got sidetracked. Everything, everybody's into the prophetic. Can I give you a prophetic statement? It's in the Bible. You all can read it for yourself in the King James, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, and it shall come to pass. Is that prophetic? Is it prophetic as it comes? So you all got a prophetic word today, okay? Well, you just did, and it's a sure word. Not funny money. You can read it for yourself and your friends. And it shall come to pass if. So is the prophetic conditional? Nobody wants to make the prophetic conditional. They're scared. God made it conditional. Right in one verse. And it shall come to pass, if you will hear what God said, and you'll do what he said, then all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. How many blessings? How many? All. When you're a doer of the Word, you don't have to look for blessings. They're going to come on you faster than you can run. If blessings aren't overtaking you like this, you're not doing the Word like you should be. Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. Another prophetic word. And it shall come to pass. Is that prophetic? If is the, is the prophetic conditional. It should come to pass if you will hear what God said, but you will not be a doer of what he said. Then all these curses or victimization of your blessings by the villain shall come upon you and overtake you. Question, is the work of the enemy conditional? Is the work of God conditional? Oh, my goodness, it's too simple. What is the condition? You're either a doer of the devil's word or you're, or you're a doer of God's word. Could this be that simple? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, it's as simple as I just gave it. Why complicated? Now, what's that got to do with anything? We're talking about familiar spirits. There are spirits that are familiar to your family tree. In King David's case, he said, 
when I was conceived, what took me to sexual sin was in my family tree. If you're not sure, look at some of David's children. One of his own sons raped his own sister. And look at Solomon. Can you imagine trying to keep 1,000 females happy? No wonder he went nuts at age 60 and died in his sins. Secret. Keep the prime rib you have and let the spare ribs go. And you may live to be 80 to 90. But then spare ribs will cut your life short. That's greater wisdom than Solomon. Familiar spirits. The things that were in David that made him do these things were the things that were in Solomon and the son that raped his sister. This Psalm 51 is so critical to why we're here today. Because many of you have inherited fear. You've inherited families that have had the great pleasure of making victims of each other. Of not loving each other. Of not forgiving each other. And most of the things that your parents did to you that you didn't like, their parents did to them. And if you're not careful, you're going to do it to your children. And your children's going to do it to their children. Because this is the way it's been going from Adam. Now, the Lord came from heaven to stop this mess. Well, then why hasn't it stopped? Because we will not make Jesus Lord. We will not be a doer of the word. Now, three ways that the enemy tracks us. Genetic impurity. Genetic impurity. Familiar spirits, which is part of epigenetics. You see? What was the third one? It'll come to me. Now, can we stop this flow? What they did in Nehemiah 9, they confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. You already know some of the garbage that's in your family tree, do you not? If you've been through for my life, many of you have. <clears throat> if not, you should come. It'll be life-changing. I've traveled worldwide, multicultural travels, multi-denominational contacts, and I have found something that has not varied in one audience for 30 years, and it's in this audience. I might just do the little survey with you guys, since we have our cameras going. I'd like the cameras to catch this if we could. That 95% of every audience that I have addressed in over 30 years, when I ask this question, have, will raise their hand. And here's the question. I'm going to do it here. And if you've been through this program and you've raised your hand once, do it again. I'm going to raise my hand. I'm a preacher's kid, and, and, and I'm, I fit the profile. I had, a, I had a pastor father that abused me in every way possible except sexual. Refused to reconcile with me to the day of his death and preached the gospel every day. I'm an only child. Voted most likely to succeed by my peers. Was a national merit finalist in, in America in English and math. Was offered a scholarship at any university in America, in a field that I wanted, full scholarship. And I chose pre-med. And it was not enough to please a pastor father. It was so bad that I would shake like I had palsy from fear. When I got old enough to leave that stressor, 
You couldn't get me in a Christian church as an adult for 20 long years. Because all that God and all that God and devil were were the same person to me. I was so darkened and so and so hurt. I'm a thriver. Are you a thriver? Are you a thriver? Are you going to be thrivers or just survivors? And God came and got me, and I got saved just in a very unusual way. Now you can't keep me at a church. If you, if you said I'd be doing what I did today 33 years ago, I'd say you're nuts. But God is greater. You know what the Bible says? I just got a preach coming. You know what the Bible says? Because many of you struggle with this iniquity. When our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows all things. Can I give you this one? Though the righteous fall seven times, they shall rise again. Get up. Keep on trucking. You don't have to live in the past. There's no time travel. This is oldies music. That's pretty good sometimes. <laughs> they confess their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. Here comes the question. How many of you growing up as children? And, and when you raise your hand, don't give me any little duck flaps. That's fear. Give me high fives. Because I want some of you here, maybe you've never been, not been to the Fort Mile program. Maybe you're here just sniffing us. It's okay. Good. I, I, all you can eat smorgasbord is you go sniff it first and look like this, like that. Thank, sniffers, thanks for coming. It could be a good meal. So give me high fives. And I want you to look around. This is more for the people that have. And I predict in this room that 95% of you will raise your hand. Are you ready for this? How many of you growing up as children do not remember hearing your earthly father say to you these words, I love you? Look around. See how close I am. Look around. Look around. Look around. Look around. Catch a picture of this. Do you think I know what I'm talking about? Every one of you had fear come into you when your father didn't cover you with love. That's why some of you have a trouble with God the Father because he has the name Father. Oh, you love Jesus. He's your good buddy. The Father? Oh, not that one. Jesus came to show us the Father. Now, do you, are you interested in breaking the iniquity of your generations while you're here today? Do you want to continue or do you want to flush it? Would you love God to deliver you of your fears? Would you love God to fix your amygdala? Did I pronounce that right? Am amygdala. In the, it's, it's these store-bought teeth gets me in trouble is what it is, you know. Hey, talking about store-bought teeth. Talking about store-bought teeth. When, 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 when Anita first came to us in San Francisco, I'm talking about me. My store-bought's, not yours. She has real ones. I have store-bought's. <laughs> I'm glad this is being recorded. Um, relax. When, when, when Anita first came to us, just absolutely devastated with disease, our team picked her up at the airport, and there was about five of us in the car. I was driving, and I had these store bots that I had to get some when I was in, in college. First year, I got pyrrhea, and I got, anyway, long story. But I had, I had damaged one of these teeth, and on the front, it would fall out of, of the store bots. So I would carry some super glue. <laughs> I would carry some super glue, and, it, and, and when it would fall out, I'd, I'd put some super glue on it, and stick it back in there, and it would be okay until it broke out again. And, 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 and I, have a, I have a heart that 
is really full of compassion. Uh, I really do. And when she got in the car, I hope I can say this without crying now. I was overwhelmed with God's love for this creature. It had come from years of devastation. I'm driving the car, and I'm just weeping, crying and bawling. You tell this story better than me. And what were you thinking in the back seat? He's got more problems than I have. <laughs> I wanted to go back to the airport. <laughs> here's, a, here's the head of this ministry, and all he's doing is crying like a baby. What have I got myself into? I thought he was having a chemical reaction. <laughs> then... She's sensitive to everything, smells and everything, severely. I've knocked this tooth out, and I get out my little thing of super glue, which smells to high heaven. I stick it on the tooth, stick it back in here, and hold it while I'm driving. And what did you think? Just what I said. <laughs> That was how we began together. Good memories. Yeah, good. Good memories. Yeah, good memories. Every one of you that didn't hear your father say to you these words, I love you, there's a void. I don't know if you know this, but the father really establishes the emotional well-being of the family not the mother. So goes the father, so goes the home, folks. It's not practiced that way anymore. It's so goes the mother, so goes the home. That's why we have the fear and dysfunction. Loving patriarchs as rare as hen's teeth. Good t hens have teeth? That's pretty rare. <laughs> Where do you get this stuff from? <laughs> <laughs> I know. No! Well, this, this thing is so serious that, well, Maria Hart does good like your medicines to take your medicine. Um, I want God to heal the broken heart here today. What's a broken heart? It's, it's a fragmentation of the human spirit and the human personality from what is normal. We're abnormal creatures trying to act normal. Our, our, our ways, his ways. If your ways aren't his ways, you're abnormal. And if you're abnormal, then the devil is the one that is the, the benefactor of your abnormality. And God doesn't get any glory out of your abnormality. So I want God to get glory out of my creation. I have committed sins under the law of Moses, folks. Look at me. Take a good picture. I have committed sins under the law of Moses that it would have been required for the elders to stone me at sundown. I don't know about your journey. I just told you mine. So I'm a dead man. And dead men are just happy to be alive. Once I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but the great father of all spirits sent his spirit to get a son. Find somebody next to you and say, well, first the guys. Find somebody and say, I'm a son of God. Oh, that's wimpy. Gosh, if you were a superstar, oh, Father, what? Ah, we're going to do this again. Find, men, find somebody next to you and say, I'm a son of God son. by faith. All right, ladies. Ladies, I want you to find somebody next to you. I hope it's your husband. <laughs> he needs to know this. <laughs> okay, ladies, you ready? I'm a daughter of the Father by faith.
Is that true? Then act like it. Talk about epigenics. Okay, I'm going to start the conversation on epigenetics, but I consider my I pronounced that again wrong, epigenetics. You said it right. I wash my car. Epigenetics. 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 Okay, um, then I will defer to Lavenda. I'll just give an overview of what she, I hope she's prepared to talk about. <laughs> um, she's a bright young lady. All right. Um, epigenetics, E-P-I-G-E-N-E-T-I-C-S. And that's a study of changes in an organism caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. And so that's why we know what God put in place is still there. And that through proper use of the word and ministry, it um, can be restored to its original function. That's what I got out of this. And a lot of this material is taken from the Journal of American uh, Medical Association. I think um, some of this uh, further research was done in 2014, so it's quite recent. And um, just going on from there, and you'll fill in the empty spaces, um, that with PTSD, um, some of these genes, and there is one called ADRB2, and I know this is getting a little technical, but Lavenda is going to make it everyday stuff. Um, at any rate, that is a um, gene that can cause illness, um, all kinds of related to stress, and also pain. And hopefully, out of some of the research that's been done, none of it is totally confirmed, but the, the findings uh, we hope will lead um, to you know, an alteration in different illnesses and pain. But we also know, again, the word of God, as it is administered here, can do the same thing. Just a, a note here, and uh, I'm, I don't know if you're going to pick up on this, but while I have it in front of me, the children are survivors, and all of us are children are survivors. And it doesn't have to be Holocaust. The home could have been a Holocaust. I mean, I'm, I barely survived myself. And uh, the children of survivors, a surprising number of them anyway, may be born less able to metabolize stress. They may be born more susceptible to PTSD, a vulnerability expressed in their molecules, neurons, cells, and genes, which leads us continue. I mean, I just want to throw that in. Okay, and some of these um, alterations... Um, and negative inputs into the genetic structure, all you really need is two stressful and very stressful events in childhood. And it's been found, like Henry was saying, it's not only with vets, but it's in the population in general. And as we know, like you were saying, stress in the black community um, can turn up a child with sickle cell anemia, for instance. Um, and I think that's pretty much what I just want to say to sort of set the stage for more discussion. I just want to read this little research. This is, was um, a survey of the Guardsmen, Ohio National Guard, uh, nearly three-quarters of the guardsmen have been deployed to combat zones, including Iraq and Afghanistan, and 42% have been seen active military combat. Was this something you're going to read, or I'm okay? Uh, service members were asked about their... Now, this is really interesting. Service members were asked about their childhood exposure to experiences of physical, sexual, or emo emotional abuse, or witnessing a violence between parents. Let me go with this again. Now, that's a strange question to ask guardsmen, isn't it? 
They were asked about their childhood exposure to experiences of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse or witnessing of violence between parents. Soldiers were further asked about adult trauma, including 33 categories of deployment and non-deployment events, and then evaluated for PTSD symptoms using a 17-item PTSD checklist. A replication cohort of predominantly African-American female civilians enrolled in the Grady Trauma Project in Atlanta were evaluated for childhood adversity, adult trauma, and PTS symptoms in a similar fashion. Now, this lines with you. We found strong evidence that the ADRB2 gene, which is what you just talked about, were associated with PTSD. In our group of male soldiers, who were predominantly of European-American ancestry, so they're, they're, in these surveys, they're picking up this gene is a carrier of something. Take it away. I know you've got stuff to talk about. Well, this is really good news. Um, forever and ever, microbiologists have said that if your DNA says this, this is just the way it is, it's going to be the way it is, always going to be the way it is, nothing's going to change. And um, it was probably in the 1940s when this, this came up the first time, and they were like laughed out of the scientific community. But it didn't go away because the evidence just keeps piling up and piling up. So we're not powerless at all. Um, th this was introduced to me by one of our PPS advisory members, pneumopsychosomatology advisory members. He brought this to my attention last February when he was here for the For My Life program, and I started studying it. And uh, we, all have, we all have genes, right? Did you know that your, your brain cell genes, your liver cell genes, you know, they all look the same, but they're expressed differently. And so that's the same thing, that's, that's what this means. Epi means over genetics. So over genetics. What is occultism? It's something that occludes God. And so God created this awesome, fearfully, wonderfully made person with perfect DNA. And what comes along to cover that is the way we think, the traumas that we've been in, which causes us to think a certain way. But the good news is, is that you actually have, I'm going to read this because, you know, this is like awesome. I don't want to miss it. You actually have a tremendous amount of control over how your genetic traits are expressed. That's good news. And that is what we teach here. So by... Hey, can I, can I raise a question? How many of you want to control your gene expression? How many ever considered you could? I have a scripture coming. The spirit of a man shall sustain him in his infirmity. What's that got to do with infirmity? Is it possible that our bodies can be responded to God, not just to things that are not of God? Do you mean to tell me that the enemy can train us to have PTSD? Exactly. And then God will help us untrain ourselves from PTSD? Exactly. So that this gene which God created to express the peace of function? We'll go back to peace of function? God created, uh, there was DNA that made up our, D, our amygdala. And so what happens is sin comes along and causes all those stress hormones to just pour out and pour out. That amygdala grows. You know, whatever the, the reason is, you know, the hypervigilance is something that he has a thought. <laughs> I blame my Columbo. <laughs> so, in the case of hypothyroidism, the female gets the thyroid listening to signals upstream through the mind body connection. The female doesn't feel safe with her husband. He's not nurturing her. She's chattel. She's a slave. She feels used, abused, and she doesn't feel safe. So through the mind-body connection, the hypothalamus sends a signal down into the endocrine system over to the thyroid, and that signal 
creates a dis-ease of function so that the thyroid doesn't produce enough thyroxin. So the, she feels tired, she feels off the off key, because that's what it makes you feel like. Now he's really upset with her. Now she's going to a doctor, and he doesn't want to spend the money. So he's really thinking she's a liability, and acts that way, treats her that way. And all of a sudden, the, we have a major, and then they give her a drug called Centroid or some bovine supplement. When all she needed for that thyroid to function was a husband that would nurture and love her. Let me ask you a question. Which is cheaper, doctor's appointments and drugs or a husband that nurtures you and loves you? And a husband is much cuter. <laughs> You know, I spend a lot of my time as a husband keeping my wife healthy. I pursue her. I date her. I make her blush from 50 feet. I irritate her in a nice way. I, I have to keep her feeling like she is important because she is. And I tell you, the effort it takes to nurture and pursue my wife is cheaper than keeping her well with doctors and much more fun. Go ahead, I just had that thought. Your genes respond to also include your conscious thoughts, emotions, and emotions and unconscious, unconscious beliefs. That's, that's what that says. And so, you know, what that is saying is that my beliefs, what I believe is going to determine how, how my genes are expressed. It's going to determine on what I pass down to my kids. Wait a minute. I have a scripture coming. All right. My oh, goodness. So as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's in the ancient writings. And they're just figuring this out in science. And all along, Pastor Henry has been teaching this and teaching this. I mean, every Friday, every Sunday, every for my life, every time. Wait we a talk. minute. Wait a minute. Don't ask me to take ownership of my thoughts and I have to think right and speak right and act right. I just need somebody to zap me with some anointing oil <laughs> or push me over and damage my spine. I need somebody with high vector to over, overtake me. You mean that my body will serve me if I serve it? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying you can take control of your health by the way you think. Am I hearing you right? That not only can you take control of your body by the way you think, that your, even your genetics will serve you properly? That is what science is even saying. They've Why does the us. church know this? Okay, well, it's your job to go back to the church and tell everybody, okay? <laughs> Say, I'm managing my genes for health. See what you get in that church when you say, uh-huh, they think you've been to some spooky convention. I know that um, growing up, um, my sister's favorite thing to say to me was, you are such a rotten kid. You've always been rotten. And so I would say it too. I'm a rotten person. I don't belong in this world. And sure enough, I got all these allergies. I had the hypothyroidism. I had everything you can imagine because I was constantly mimicking what other people said about me as a child. I think I was a pretty nice kid. I, I didn't bother anybody until they bothered me. And then there was trouble. But um, we just have to be so careful of what we put out. You know, I'm really feeling sick today. I feel sick all the time. Well, then that's a message you're giving your body and your immune system responds. It goes down and so forth. So I'm sure all of you can think of something negative you probably say a lot, maybe before you came to this ministry. You need to cancel the assignment of those words. Pull them down. 
And this is what science has been telling us forever is, and, you know, and I have to say this, Darwin is not happy with epigenetics. Darwin. <laughs> is he still alive? Has he been raised from the dead? Well, he lives in our public school books. <laughs> he lives in our public school books. Well, I live in my ancient writings. So that is why PTSD can be inherited. If you have parents who didn't know how to handle fear, then they, they have, their genetics have been occluded with something else that tells them how to not be able to deal with fear. And so you have a child raised, and he may not have PTSD or something like that, but something happens, and it happened to everybody else in the classroom. But to that kid, they went all freaky because he was predisposed because of epigenetics to not be able to metabolize the fear. A bit of research that I have here looking at me. Um, some of these studies um, offer proof of concept for intergenerational transmission, of vulnerability to stress-related consequences, and detail a plausible mechanism for explaining how childhood adversity increases risk for the development of PTSD following traumatic events experienced in childhood and then into adulthood. Another one here I was just reading. I don't know if you have it in your notes or not, this research. Uh, it talks about maternal PTSD, where the mother has it, may convert confer risk for PTSD in offspring by modifying biological substrates that will influence how the offspring will respond to a future environmental challenge. You know, I, I'm just hearing the scriptures again. The iniquities of the fathers shall be visited to the third and fourth generation. I, 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 I kind of understand the, those coming out of captivity in Nehemiah when they heard the reading of the word by Ezra the high priest, and they saw what the word said about what happened to their parents. They saw and why they went into captivity. And they saw it in their own lives and their children's lives. And they realized something, that they didn't deal with it before God, that what happened to their parents and grandparents would happen to them and their children. Generational iniquity and the teachings of it is a rare teaching in Christianity around the world because you're told that the penalty of the curse was taken care of at the cross. And folks, that's true. But only true at this level. Did Jesus pay for the penalty of the curse on the cross in obedience or disobedience to the Father? In obedience? The church, I'm an elder, I can say what I want. 30 years of observation of the mess. The church is trying to appropriate in disobedience what Jesus did in obedience, and it's not working. Why would you take communion and not repent for your participation with sin? And if you don't deal with your participation with sin, the broken body is not going to work for you. You can take, you can take communion all you want as a sacrament, but it doesn't mean you live it. It isn't the sacrament. It's a living relationship with God that makes the sacrament work, not a ritual. Are you tracking with me? I think we need to go back to basics quick here in Christianity. I'm not sure America is going to survive it. 
I don't know what's going to happen with America. Pray for America. The ancient writings say this, righteousness exalts a nation. The converse of this equation is unrighteousness will debase a nation. America, of all industrialized nations, is now number 45 in terms of longevity. One third of its people on psychiatric medicines. America is the last of 45 industri industrialized nations not to ban GMO products. GMO products will kill you. Your body wasn't designed to handle genetically modified food. Be careful. Can you do anything about it? Sure you can. If you're taught right, if somebody gives you the information to give you wisdom, but you'll never have wisdom if you don't have knowledge. And superstition is what we have. Or fear faith. I hope to God it's going to work out. That's not taking ownership, is it? Why don't you, God? Um, I wanted to share that, I, personally, how epigenetics has expressed itself in my family. Uh, my grandfather was a World War I vet. And he, I remember him singing, just, just singing over and over and over these, these songs. I mean, everybody died around him. It was, it was pretty horrific. And my, his son committed suicide. Um, my, it's something that I certainly tried. And my nephew just this year committed suicide. Now, that there, that there's a pre, there was a predisposition in my life, I know, that um, when I was five, my whole Sunday school class was abused in church. And so, but not everybody ended up like I did because, you know, they did not have that, that their DNA hadn't been covered over by something that had been passed down to the generations. And that's why it's just so important that we, 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 do, we do look back to our generations and we see what's going on because it's being passed down. It may not, it may not express itself in your generation, but it might in the next. Because the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may desire. desire. And at the most opportune time, when it's going to make the, cause the most trouble, is when it's going to be expressed. And so this is exciting news that just by the way we talk to our children every day can change their genetic makeup or the way their genes are expressed. So I'm, are, I'm are excited. You, are you listening to what she's saying? That you have the ability to set in motion health for your children by how you conduct yourself in the family as a safe place? rather than taking them to doctors and psychiatrists because you did not create a safe place, to have them fix your children, to send them back to the unsafe place, to be reprogrammed again with genetic expression that's wrong? I don't want this to sound as an accusation to anyone. But what purpose is it to come here and we can't expect change? God represents change from what is wrong to what is right. That's the power of the cross. The power of the cross is that sin can be defeated. Would you help defeat it? What you're saying, see what it says in the, in the ancient writings. It says, the iniquities of the fathers should be visited to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Say, well, how do I hate God? Verse 6. But to them that love me and keep my commandments, blessings to thousands. How does God know that you love him? Because you go to church? Because you sing real hard? Pay your tithe? 
He knows you love him if you hear what he said and do it. If not, he's not your Lord. You can put Jesus' Lord signs all over your car, all over your house, all over your churches. It's religious vanity. The sign doesn't make him Lord. He's Lord without your sign. But is he Lord of your life? Are you tracking with me? Jesus said this, if you'd like to believe Jesus. That's what they said he said. Jesus said, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. So the Lord said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your might. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon this, all of the law and the prophets is the foundation. Love the Father. Love the living word who came in the flesh. Love the Holy Spirit. Love the Godhead. Hear what God said and decide that you agree. Because when God said it, he said amen. To himself. So if God said amen to himself when he read it, he said amen. Then I say amen to the amen who said amen when he said amen to himself. Can you say that slow? I said to the amen said amen to himself when he said it. Then I say amen to the amen who said amen to himself when he said it. You didn't think I could do that twice, did you? Did you get that? Did I do it too fast? If the amen said amen to himself when he said it, then I say amen to the amen who said amen to himself when he said amen. So if God said amen, I say amen to the man who said amen. And when you say amen to the amen who said amen when he said amen, <laughs> you're saying, so be it. Amen. So be it. So when, when the Word says you're to love your neighbor as yourself, if you don't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor. And if you don't love yourself, you haven't received the love of the Father. So the beginning of this journey of creating a safe place is receive the love of the Father, begin to receive and love yourself in creation, and if at all possible, make peace with your neighbor. If at all possible. But your peace of mind has nothing to do with anybody else. If your peace of mind has to do with how somebody else responds to you, you're an idolatry to them, and they're your source. He is your source. Be Noah, float the boat. Be Noah, float the boat. Now, did you get a picture of epigenetics? Something invisible, utilizing thought through the human is able to change gene function. This is different than mutation. You know, I was, I was just going to read something here. Could I, could I just read something? Yep. Uh, this is by a doctor. It says, you actually have a tremendous amount of control over how your genetic traits are expressed by changing your thoughts and altering your diet and your environment. Certain doctors have said that environmental signals, which include thoughts and emotions, both of which have been shown to directly affect DNA expression. Another thought, thing I want to read here. <clears throat> Your emotions regulate your genetic expression. I want happy genes. <laughs> Find somebody next to you and say, I want my genes to be happy. So I must be happy. Because if I'm unhappy, I'm going to have unhappy genes. And if my genes are unhappy, my poor body's unhappy. And lots of doctors are going to make money off of my genes unhappiness. 
And my kids' jeans will be unhappy. And my kings, my kids' jeans. Let me read this to you here. Your genes respond to includes your conscious thoughts, emotions, and unconscious beliefs. That's why I taught you the unconscious, the, the spirit of man, what speaks to your spirit to influence you. Um, nutrition can alter genetic expression. Healthy lifestyle supports genetic expression. What can I say? One thing I wanted to leave with you here in this familial part is a little research out of Wikipedia. Not that it's always correct. It talks about mutations of, of DNA and genetic recombination or re-expression genetically. But it, and it, this is where I really wanted to go, is most genes that you have in your body belong to larger gene families of shared ancestry. That's why you can track certain diseases in certain... Um, uh, certain uh, national, uh, you know, ancestral national, like, for example, we talked about, in, in, in all due respect to the black community, uh, sickle cell anemia. But sickle cell anemia is also a Jewish plague. Now, why, what, it, what is the connection between the black community and the Jewish community? Well, sickle cell anemia is the, 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 um, the cell is not fully formed. It's like a seed, and it's anemic. In our understanding of certain cultures, certain cultures have not had a father at home. In all due respect to the black community, many of your homes are run by mothers and grandmothers. The male is out looking for a spare rib. I'm being very honest, folks. And when he finds a spare rib, he spends all of his money taking care of the spare rib, goes honky-tonking with the spare rib, and the whole family suffers. I'm telling you the truth, aren't I? But that's inherited. That need to be loved is so strong inherited in that male that even a Solomon's thousand wives couldn't satisfy him because he's a hunter, the need to be loved. So the families don't have the loving support of a father at home. The wife doesn't have the husband to support her, and she's stressed, she's abandoned, and she feels like chopped liver on the side. Let's talk about the Jewish families. Oh, could I interject sure. there? Sure, sure. Because I think you have to even look further back to slavery when the men were separated from their family. So that whole problem goes way back, you know, to what we had in America. This is ancestry. The Jewish problem. I do a lot with Jewish... Uh, diseases. They had great success in helping Jewish people get healed because they have to recover themselves from their ancestral iniquity. In the Jewish family, most families that are Jewish are ruled by the female. They're matriarchal families. The male is preoccupied with forgetting He's the descendant of Abraham. He's automatically blessed. There's a ways he working so hard to prove it. So he's a workaholic. He's not there for the wife. He's not there for the children. He's working 18, 16 hours a day. The whole family is run by the female and matriarchal, and you have this entire abandonment by a father. So the abandonment means lack of nurturing by a father. Sickle cell anemia is because of lack of nurturing by a father. Not a mother, a father. Both cultures, black and Jewish, have abandonment by a father in the family tree. It's classic, it's observable, and it tracks genetically. Something to think about, isn't it? What is in your ancestry that's tracking? Listen, I'm barely escaping the iniquity of my family tree. 
I was shocked to find out what was in me that I inherited. It almost killed me a few years ago. I went through the valley of the shadow of death in, in uh, 11, 2011. I didn't go to heaven. I didn't go to hell. So here I am. But I had a, I had a massive heart attack doing a conference in Trinidad and Tobago. They didn't think I was going to live. Told my wife I would not live. Take a good picture. What they told me is that I had clogging of the arteries not because of high cholesterol. Because of a genetic defect. Every man in my family tree that are rights, including my own father, died of heart attacks. Every single male died of a heart attack. It's the right plague. No, it's the wrong plague in the rights. Then. It's the wrong plague in the rights. Let me say it that way. And when my doctors told me that I had a genetic defect, I teach this stuff, what causes clogging of the arteries that's not cholesterol. I, didn't, I thought I was so cool in my self-righteousness being an overcomer, that I, if I'd listened to my wife, I'd have been further ahead because she lives with me. And she loves me. And the things that destroyed the rights were in me spiritually. When I came through this, I don't know how many of you have known me, but I'm not the same Henry I was four or five years ago spiritually and psychologically in my personality. I'm much calmer, <laughs> thoughtful, pleasant, happier, because when you're a dead man, you're just happy to be alive. Just happy to be alive. If I can get another 10, 20 years out of this thing, it'll be a miracle. I turned 71 this year. Thanks for asking. Most people my age have retired. I, I don't know that if you know in the Bible there's no such thing as retirement. You serve until you fly. Retirement is forced on people in the pecking order. We lost a lot of our maturity through the forcing of retirement by industry. And that's unfortunate. We, we lost a lot of elders. I'm an elder. Okay. Okay, let's do this. Did we finish epigenics? Did we finish cortisol imprint? Because we've got, we've got a... Well, we talked about cortisol imprint, didn't we? A little bit, yeah. Did we did we show all of our did we show chart G two up there at all? What was G two anyway? We didn't show G one. We didn't show G one. What's G one? Oh, that's epigenetics. Take a good picture. Okay, let's move on. What's J one? What's J one? Oh yeah, J one. I love this. Take me back over to the other one that's, I just want to show them something. Take me back to the first one, which shows the awful part of this. Okay. Here's what mankind looks like all over the world. I have to be honest with you, the church is full of it too. We've got fear, we've got guilt, we've got shame. It's passing right down in our families and our marriages and our, our children. We've got unloveliness, conflict, sadness. We have unloving spirits, spirits of rejection, occultism, accusation, unkindness, bitterness, impatience, addiction, self-indulgence, harshness, unfaithfulness. We feel separated from God. We feel hopeless about ourselves and worthless when it comes to others. Who am I? Why am I here? And who cares? This is not what God created, folks. This is not what God created. This is transferring in mankind. Would you like to stop it? Who's going to stop it? Me. Who's we? No, it's an I. I say, I am going to stop it. I am going to stop it. I, I am going to stop it. Who's going to stop it? I. I'm going to stop it. Go to that next chart. This is what I should look like. No, I want you to show what you look like. 
<laughs> so take a good picture of this. Say, this is who God saw me as. Full of love, righteousness, honor, peace, joy, love. I trust God. Submission, humility, gentleness, faith. You know what these all are? The fruits of the Holy Spirit. If you want a picture of who you really are, go to Galatians. You'll find yourself in there. Take a good picture and say, God, form me into your image. Form me into it. See, I'm tired of the other stuff ruling my family tree and me. That's how you begin, isn't it? We want to be, begin to move in towards the ministry part. We finished the cortisol imprint. I think we talked about. And I'd like, to, I'd like to begin the time of application with you, if I may. And, uh, and we begin to focus on this, if we could. I want to take time before we start the ministry time for you that are here. We're doing live streaming all over the world. I don't want your ministry time to be in live streaming. But those of you that are watching this today, thank you for joining us via technology. And I'd like to pray for you. I know that you're out there. And I know that God is speaking to you. Oh, is he talking to you like he's talking to those that are here? The things that you've heard today, you understand it bears witness. And it bears witness not just because we said it. It bears witness because the Holy Spirit's bearing witness because the Holy Spirit knows you from the inside out. And if we're honest, we'll allow God to reveal to us the things that are not his image the things that are not good for mankind. And as all of you out there watching this on your TVs or your computers, I want to pray for you. Father, you're everywhere by your Spirit. As they've opened their hearts, Father, I ask that you'd meet every individual in their own journey as they begin to take ownership of their own life before you. The information that we've, we've given, use it to help them understand their family tree. Rather than being embittered against their family tree, give them a compassion. I was so moved by Jesus on the cross. He ex experienced everything that PTSD would represent. Brutally murdered painfully crucified. And yet he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Give us the compassion to begin to disassociate with what's tracking with us. Give us the ability to have self-discernment. I pray that those that are watching will begin to be honest with God, honest with your Father, about your personal life, let it come up. Tell him. Talk to your Father in heaven. Come to him in Jesus' name and say, Father, I hate this stuff. I realize how fear has plagued me all my life. It has made me afraid of circumstances and people and has kept me in this little prison house of performance and, 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 and all the things that the flashbacks that the enemy takes me back to the past that programs my present and my future. Enough of it. I pray for you watching that the Father, by his precious Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, will release you from your fears. The programming of your spirit and your soul, that you'll begin the process of having your mind renewed. Taking ownership of your life so your genes will be happy. Being able to release these fears and these traumas and all these remembrances that have been plaguing you and tormenting you. Yes, I even pray for your amygdala. That as you appropriate the peace of God. For you, yourself personally. I speak to this little almond-sized gland. In Jesus' name, begin to shrink. 
begin to shrink. Quit processing fear syndromes. Quit expressing yourself with a continual torment of the memory and all the trauma. I speak to it that these memories and these things the enemy is conjuring up from deep within will become just a fading memory. I come against the torment. I come against the fears, and I release you from it now in Jesus' name. I also release you to begin conversation with your families. Talk it up. Talk about what you've heard. Begin to bring salvation to your home in a way that you've never seen before. Rather than running everybody to the doctors and the psychiatrist, let's get around the family altar again. Let's begin to go to the ancient writings of the Word. Let's begin to study how God thinks and what He has said, that we can have our mind renewed. Thereby, we have an antidote to the thoughts of the enemy coming to a temptation. I speak healing. I speak deliverance. I speak restoration. I speak conversion of the human spirit and the human soul in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, that was awesome. We trust that God our Father has met you and will continue to meet you. This is only the beginning. And I hope you realize that during the conference, it is much more than just the healing of PTSD, but it truly is the healing of our hearts. You know, if you're new to being health, I encourage you to get to know us a little bit more. There are tons of ways to do that. You can check out our website at beinghealth.com. You can sign up for our weekly emails and our blogs. Uh, go to our Facebook page, hit the like button, read through the posts. If you've not subscribed to our YouTube channel, do so to that. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the little bell thing that hits you notifications when new releases come out. That way it keeps you in the loop. Also, don't forget today, all BN Health resources are 20% off until midnight tonight. It's a great savings to you, and you can get a copy of this conference, Overcoming PTSD in CD format. One last reminder, we are offering our For My Life online course for $100 off today only. Click that link below for the, for the registration link. And lastly, but not leastly, thank you so much for hanging out with us to the end and just being available today for God to work in your hearts. At times throughout the conference, you may have seen links pop up, giving you an opportunity to support Be In Health financially. This helps us extend further the mission that God has called us to here at Hope of the Generations Church and Be In Health. We are a debt-free organization that operates on faith and the faithful support of so many precious people to get this job accomplished. It's not too late to give. There's a link below in this video that will direct you to our giving page. And with that, God bless you. And we look forward to seeing you here at Thomason, Georgia, one of our conferences on the road. And we just pray God continues to bless you in your endeavors. Have a great day. Having the For My Life program online has been kind of a dream of ours because, you know, not everybody can come here at this time or any time. Maybe, maybe you're too sick or, or maybe just your life circumstances won't allow you to do that. I don't want you to think you're, feel, you're being cheated because you're not able to come here. God will meet you in a most amazing way. But the For My Life online to me is a very intimate time with the Lord. What I mean by that is, you know, some of my greatest breakthroughs with God have been in my prayer closet, or it's been I've heard something or I've read something in the scripture, and I didn't have the distractions of anyone around me to be able to thwart maybe what God was wanting to do in my life. It's also a time for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things of your past that brought you to the present. And, it, and, and he, that he can be able to speak to you and convict you and show you things that maybe you've never seen before. Because I know that when you hear these teachings, you are going to hear things that, yes, you may have read so many times or maybe never, but, they're, the, but, but God's gonna ignite something in the times that you hear this. 
and you are going to be able to just totally surrender to him vulnerability and also humility also too because you're reflecting on the past that brought you to the present we also give you hope for the future the thing is is that before god he begins to ignite things and that be still and know that i am god moment where he shows you oh my goodness i have tools to overcome forever and ever for as long as i'm here on this earth i can overcome so i really hope that you consider taking the for my life online not for us but for you